Thank you, Nicole, once again, for helping moderate this room. And I, uh, I want to mention something to all of our participants, and that is there's a little, at least on mine, there's a, there's a horizontal gray line that separates the, the screen that's shared below from the, from the webcams up above. And you can grab that little hamburger. There's like three little lines between them. So if you want to see the webcams larger or the, or the uh, shared screen larger, you can slide that to, to suit your own needs. With that, I would love to introduce Derek Hahn, who is a coworker of mine. He is trained as a civil engineer, got his degree from the University of Idaho, go Vandals. And he has been at the district for 10 years, had about four more years of experience before that in the consulting world. He has experience designing and implementing very close to a thousand rain gardens and other rainwater uh, catchment type systems. He enjoys teaching about green stormwater infrastructure to adults and to the youth. He's a core part of the community conservation team at the Conservation District. He's a wizard in CAD. And uh, one interesting fact about Derek is that he has been a competitive swing dancer. Uh, so with that, I will mention a little bit about his presentation. And I'm sure you've, you know all about this. That's why you're signed up for this. But uh, in light of his experience with green stormwater infrastructure projects, he's going to highlight two different projects that that involve treating barnyard waste and uh, normally in green storm water infrastructure infrastructure you've got to pay close attention to the amount of pollution generating surfaces that drain into that and that's what makes this unique is it's a way to uh, stretch his his design of these systems but also uh, a way to approach the challenge of collecting barnyard waste in a way that doesn't just add to the overload of the size of the storage structure that that may not be adequate to handle that. So with that, Derek, I'm going to turn it over to you. But before I do, I'm going to throw one little twist in. And that is I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to pick the word gains. Uh, see if you can throw that into your, your presentation. Nicole picked the word puzzle for me. So if you want bonus points, you can incorporate the word puzzle and games. So okay. there we go. Take it away, Derek. Cool. All right, everybody can see me okay? Everything coming up all right? Yeah, everything looks great. Thank you, right. Derek. So um, the uh, vegetative treatment area, or VTA as I'll refer to it in the rest of the presentation, uh, is actually an RCS practice code, and it's pretty underused in general. Um, it's a little bit tricky to get to use. Uh, the code itself is pretty vague in general. The basic idea is taking uh, livestock waste and running it through a strip of vegetation. Uh, and it's partly underused because it's a little bit underpowered. It's a little bit hard to size. Um, uh, and honestly, in terms of mitigating barnyard pollutants, just straight vegetation over native soils isn't real fantastic, especially when it comes to removing nutrients. Um, and, uh, so uh, I'm gonna share with you kind of what we have done. So my background is in green stormwater infrastructure. I've been doing uh, uh, rain garden work and, uh, and really bioretention work. Uh, bioretention is the word that I'm going to be using today much more than rain gardens because that's really what we're doing here. Uh, the difference between a bioretention facility and a rain garden is just that bioretention facilities are much higher engineered 
and it requires some much more significant heavy lifting from a modeling standpoint and a testing standpoint. Um, so uh, I have 14 years experience doing that. And I'd always wanted to implement a uh, some type of bioretention facility uh, in a livestock situation. Um, and so, and found this lesser used uh, code, the uh, 635 code in the NRCS. And so myself and another coworker uh, figured out a way to implement a number of these within our district. Uh, and, and they've been really, really successful. We started doing this about three years ago. Uh, so I'm gonna explain to you kind of what they look like, uh, how they work, and then we're gonna go through the different features of, of how we use this implementation of the VTA. So the first uh, implementation was on the Qualco Dairy. This is south of Monroe, just a little bit north of Duval. Um, and they had this big strip right in front of the dairy of land with a couple of old outbuildings that they, they wanted to get rid of. Uh, and the land was, was available uh, for use. So uh, the, the interesting thing about the Qualco Dairy, I'm sure some of you have had opportunity to go out there, is they have a really large anaerobic digester on site. Uh, that minute that they send uh, all of their dairy waste to. Uh, and then in addition to sending their dairy waste, they actually are always trucking in uh, other things that need to be digested. So that includes things like pig blood and fish parts and expired sodas, expired foods, uh, dairy waste from other dairies. Um, and that means that they have really large trucks driving through their parking lot all the time that carry loads that if there was a spill would cause really significant damage. Uh, the tributary to this uh, to the Snoqualmie is just on the other side of that building that you can see right here in this picture. And if they had a 100,000 gallon spill of pig blood, it would go through a ditch line directly into the tributary with no type of filtration. So they wanted to put in some kind of filter uh, to mitigate for that, as well as taking care of existing pollution problems that they had on site from their existing driveway uh, and, and a, a couple of areas of paved dairy uh, that tied directly to their ditch line. So we have put in this, this went in about three years ago. This is their VTA. Uh, where is the thing I pushed so you can see my cursor? Um, Ryan, are you able to guide him? You were able to find that pretty easy on your end. Yeah. I can the, see your mouse, Derek. Oh, you can see my mouse? Okay. What well, if you can see my mouse, yeah. that work. I'll just do that. Yeah. Also, at the, yeah. at the bottom of that little control panel, you have some different tools that you could use, like a, okay. a kind of a big, wide highlighter or things like that. I'll just use the cursor. So Thank you guys. over this direction is is the parking lot. It's about uh, an acre and a half in size, and then there's probably another half acre of contributing paved dairy area. And uh, the trucks come in and out here, and the and the anaerobic digester tipping uh, well is back here. Uh, and so the uh, they put in some catch basins to collect all that water, and all that water comes and discharges to here, works its way through the swale. And then there's an overflow on the other end in case that ever needs to be engaged. So that's the first of the two VPAs, VTAs that we're going to be talking about. The other one is a large uh, dairy on Camino. Uh, and they have a really large paved area where they keep all of their silage. And that also gets some contributing dairy area. And it's about four acres in size of total contribution area. And the, the runoff coming from that was incredibly polluted and they were starting to get flagged uh, in the nearby stream. So they needed to come up with some way of mitigating that runoff pollution. So uh, we uh, implemented this, which is a very large uh, tiered uh, VTA. Uh, this is before it's been planted. Every one of these check dams that you see here is another berm. So this is a series of cascading berms that works its way all the way down. This is 550 feet long and 50 feet wide and takes a very heavy load of pollution from that dairy. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is a couple of days ago. This is looking upstream at it uh, after it has, had been planted. So really when it's all done, you can't really tell what's going on there, but there is a huge amount of work that went into 
uh, getting this constructed. So what is a VTA? My version of the VTA, again, is a hybrid between bioretention and the classical um, the, the classical NRCS code uh, is basically you're digging a great big hole. Uh, it's about two and a quarter feet deep. Um, and you're sending polluted water to it. And in ideal situations, this water is filtering down into this soil. The pollution in the soil, the pollutants in the soil, or the pollutants engage with the soil and the soil helps remove those and mitigate those. And then it continues to drain down into the native soils underneath. And that's the really important part. Ideally, we are never getting an overflow from the system. All the water is infiltrating on site. Um, uh, the uh, Qualco Dairy site has never had an overflow. It's been very, very effective. The Danielson Dairy has had one or two overflow events, but it seems that infiltration is increasing over time, and we hope that within another year or two, they will not be getting overflow events. Uh, so first thing we do is we dig a big hole. Um, this is a small rain garden that we have done in residential systems. Uh, we have a crew that we use uh, called the Veteran Conservation Corps that comes in and does these for us. They're uh, managed by us and my team. Um, and uh, But I'm going to walk you all the way through one of these and then kind of extrapolate it to the larger uh, VTA system. So you can see that we've dug these sidewalls as vertical as possible, and that's because we're trying to maximize the bottom area of this facility. Uh, the larger the bottom area, the more area we have for infiltration and, and we're really trying to maximize the amount of infiltration uh, we can get. Um, the one exception to that is if we're next to impervious areas or surfaces uh, like walkways or pavement, um, we don't want to have that vertical up and down. Um, we usually want to have a one-to-one -one side slope because the backfill that we're going to be filling this back in with is pretty squishy and if we park a really big vehicle on a pavement here, they could break off and, and squish into the, into the facility. This is what the Qualco facility looked like after it had been excavated. We removed 1,200 cubic yards of soil from this site. Uh, they had a space on site where they could use it. Uh, this took them about a week and a half to dig out. Um, and uh, you can see we have this really gradual side slopes here. And that's because instead of the vertical ones, and that's because in this particular facility, uh, we had to dig down in order to engage with well draining soils. This site had been filled with about five feet of, of, um, of uh, uh, fill, uh, highly compacted fill that wasn't suitable for infiltration. So we had to get down to a grade where it would work uh, and where it would infiltrate well. But in normal situations, I've had, I'd have that be more vertical. Um, so after we've dug the hole, we put we backfill it. Where I like to tease the crew that their job is digging a giant hole and then filling it back in. Um, and so what we do is we did we fill it with 18 inches of a bioretention soil. I'm going to get a little bit into what that means later on, but it's a very specially designed type of soil that we use for all of our bioretention facilities. We then cover it with three inches of a wood strand mulch. That mulch layer is super important, especially when it comes to VTAs. And then we leave about six, at least six inches of a ponding depth. So it kind of has a bowl shape when we're finished. Um, and that's uh, so that if water ever does get up above the mulch layer, uh, it stays in that ponding depth uh, uh, so that it can drain back down. This is what the bioretention soil looks like after we place it. It's very rich, it's about 60% sand and 40% compost. It drains relatively quickly, about 12 inches per hour. Uh, and you can see that bowl shape that we're going for when we uh, when we backfill. This is what the Qualco Dairy looked like after we put that bioretention soil down. We backfilled with around a little bit under 500 cubic yards of bioretention soil. After we've put the bioretention soil in, we then cover it with mulch. Um, this is a really important part of this uh, process. The mulch that we use is 100% wood. We don't use bark. Uh, we want to keep as much fines out of this as possible because if the mulch has a high fine layer, it'll actually plug up the underlying soils. 
Uh, the purpose of the mulch is one, to keep weeds down, and the mulch that we use is the best product we've found for keeping weeds down. And it's pretty impressive. Uh, I use it all over my property at home just because it does such a good job. Uh, it also prevents the underlying soil from compacting. It kind of makes this mat over the top uh, so that you can walk all on it and some very minor traffic over the top without having to worry about squishing those soils and keeping them from being able to infiltrate. Uh, it allows water to percolate through it when water is coming in, but it also allows makes an insulation layer during the summer to keep some moisture in so that the plants don't um, don't dry up. This is what the Qualco dairy facility looked like after we had put the mulch layer in. Uh, we have to have an inlet of some kind, so we have to get a, have a way of getting water into the facility. Uh, we almost always use some type of rock. These soils are very sensitive to erosion, especially channelized erosion. Uh, the mulch as well, so we add some kind of erosion control uh, rock pad to the outlet. You can see here the pipe um, inlet from this downspout here is right there, and we just add a little pad around it to take some of the energy out of the water so it doesn't erode our soils. Uh, this is that what that looks like in the Qualco Gear Dairy. We made much bigger rocks because of the pipe going into this facility is 12 inches in diameter, uh, and when it rains really hard, uh, we're close to pipe full. Uh, we have to get have some way of getting water out of the facility in case we get a really bad rain and, uh, and the whole facility fills up. So we usually what we do is we just have a weir on the other end uh, where the water can, if, if the water elevation gets high enough, it just flows safely to a location that's not going to cause any flooding damage. Uh, Derek, can I can I interrupt you with a question? Yes, go ahead. We had just uh, two questions come in over that segment. Uh, the first one, um, where do you get the type of mulch or, that you recommend? Yeah, I'm, so I'm going to cover specifically the type of mulch in a little bit of a later slide. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but that's a really important question because because it, it's something that we know how to get up in our district because uh, we've been working here for a while, but when we go work in other districts, sometimes it's a little tricky to find the exact right product. But yeah, I will cover that. What okay, was the other? The, the other question was in regard to cost, which you might also cover, um, but it at, said, um, I would love to know what the cost share and cost to the landowner was for installation, just rough numbers, if yeah. possible. In other words, how were the dairy projects funded? Yes, so both of these that I'm showing you now were done under commission grants. And they were both done for exactly fifty thousand dollars. So uh, that that was the funding for both of these, and and so uh, uh, hundred percent cost share for both of these projects. Okay, um, tally ho. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. This is a so the over drain the overflow for this system is a special type of drain that we developed at the district called a vertical under drain and how this works i'm going to explain this a little bit in more detail later uh, but we actually put uh, basically a vertically oriented piece of pipe it's uh, 18 inches in diameter in that bioretention so this is the bioretention soil here and then we make this cop this little pocket sock of drain rock here and the idea is that water infiltrates into the soil uh, the bioretention soil and then it goes down underneath and the bottom of this uh, uh, vertical under drain is open and the water wells up here and then leaves via an underground pipe and i'm going to explain a little later in the presentation the benefit of using this model we've used this in probably close to 30 different rain gardens and bioretention facilities and it works really well uh, if you are struggling with uh, an adequate way to um, to handle overflow for your facility. Um, this is the eventual overflow for the Camano facility. You can see these terracing um, weirs here, and then the overflow here just outlets to the existing field. Uh, they get, like I said, they get very little overflow from this facility. Most of it infiltrates, but the little that does overflow just runs out into their field. So the planning for this looks like um, we want to do the construction for this during the summer. That's really, really important. You pretty much can't do this in, uh, when it's raining. The soils, the bioretention soil that we put down is very sensitive to uh, moisture. 
If you place it wet, it will not drain like it's supposed to. So all of this has to be done in dry weather. So we do all the planning in the winter. Uh, the exception to the construction thing for the summer is we like to uh, do the planting in the late fall, just because then we don't have to spend all summer watering it. Um, once we put the mulch down, the whole system is pretty stable. It can handle larger floods or larger rain events, I mean. And, um, and so we usually finish in July or August and then come back in late September or October and do the plant. Uh, what we're looking for is well draining soils. We're trying to get this to infiltrate as good as possible. Uh, that being said, there's all kinds of things that we can do in spots that are not well draining. A lot of these livestock locations are in very tricky soils. Um, but uh, when I, I get a lot of people that come to me when it comes to bioretention, and they're like, I've got a really good spot. There's this spot on my property that never drains. And that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, soils that drain really well. Um, uh, if you do have hard pan or some kind of clay, we can work with it. The one thing I cannot uh, mitigate for is a high water table. I can't infiltrate water into water. So uh, that is usually when things get really tricky and this might not be the best solution is if there's a really high water table. Uh, one problem that comes up uh, is elevation and slope. I, uh, there's an issue that happens where if we put one of these in on land that's too flat and then there's an issue that comes in where if we put one of these on land that's too steep. And the Qualco is a good example of what happens when it's too flat. And the, uh, the Camino one is when it is a little bit too steep. So if it's too flat, we need to figure out how to get that piped, uh, that piped water into the bioretention facility. And if we have a really long run like we did in the Qualco facility, uh, it was over 300 feet and we had to get our pipe slope we end up, we have to outlet that pipe, oops, sorry. We have to outlet that pipe in the top of the rain garden above the mulch, that has to happen. We cannot outlet it underneath the soil. Um, so then you end up with the situation that we ended up with in the Qualco um, uh, facility where we had to dig down a little bit in order to pick up the elevation we needed for that pipe. The other issue that comes up is if you're too steep, you need the bottom of the facility to be flat and level so you can get as much even infiltration as possible. So if you're dealing with a grade, all of a sudden you have this crazy upper edge that you have to dig that might be you know seven or eight feet tall. Um, but the way that we've, and we dealt with that when we did the Camino facility, um, we had a grade of about 5% slope, which is a little bit too much. And the way we dealt with that was putting in those terraces so that it's flat for a little bit and then it drops down another, a foot or to a foot or half a foot to a foot and then it's flat again and then it drops back down again. When we're putting these in, they need, there's a number of setbacks you have to consider. They need to be 10 feet from buildings. They need to be five feet from utilities. You don't want to build one of these over the top of an existing gas line or something like that. Uh, three feet from property lines, two feet from paved surfaces, again, to, keep, to help protect those paved surfaces and keep them from squishing into the facility. And we wanna be outside of the tree crowns if possible, because we don't wanna be killing trees to put in a facility. Uh, this is one that we did in Everett, and you can see the soil is very poor in this situation. They basically chiseled it out uh, with shovels. It, it wasn't really dug. Uh, this is really, really dense clay. You could probably throw a pot out of some of the clay that came out of this. We had put in a whole bunch of mitigating uh, things in order to try to adapt for that. And this system was designed to be wet most of the time. It actually ended up infiltrating much better than we thought it would. Um, and right now it, it infiltrates great. They get almost no overflow events during a storm. Um, so soils in general are unpredictable. And even in a situation like this, we can make something work. Um, even though we had people walking by asking if we were putting in a hot tub because it just looked like a big swimming pool. Uh, how to size your VTA. So um, when I do rain garden sizing, I do a really simple sizing uh, exercise where I go through this. This is from the rain garden handbook that uh, WSU Extension put out. Uh, and it just kind of goes through some different parameters and different variables for how to size uh, a facility. This works fine. 
However, for these larger facilities, I use WWHM, which is the Western Washington Hydrology Model, which is a much more robust modeling system um, where I put inputs and it ran a couple million different um, scenarios to try and uh, design for the worst case scenario. Uh, if you were going to do a larger system like this, I recommend using WWHM. Uh, how to build it. So first thing you need to do is have the utilities located. Um, that's a really big deal. Again, we don't want to build this over the top of existing utilities. Um, that soil mix, uh, that 18 inches is uh, recommended by the Department of Ecology. Uh, we don't put in any facilities that have less than 18 inches of bioretention uh, soil. Uh, it needs to be replaced dry, like I said, and then trying to avoid any compaction placing that soil is really important. We usually try to work from the outside edges of the facility when we're spreading it and raking it. Uh, and uh, if we do have to get it on, on top of the soil, we usually use big sheets of plywood to put it over the top to spread our weight out so we don't have to worry about compaction. Um, that soil mix is, again, about 35 to 40% compost and 60 to 40, 60 65% sand. We uh, tend to only use the Cedar Grove mix because they've spent a couple million dollars really dialing in a spec for that. There are other producers that are coming along and doing a much better job at getting a, a well-produced bioretention soil. In general, we only use bioretention soil and not rain garden mix, um, uh, just because the specs on the bioretention soil are much finer uh, and it tends to perform much better over time. Uh, that mulch, like the question I asked, so coarse and woody, trying to get 100% uh, wood is really important. We like to use a product called Animal Friendly Hog Fuel. It's a really weird name, I know. Um, but this is a shredded mulch product. It's not chips. One of the problems with chips is that they're kind of free floating. So if we do get a ponding event, all the chips will float to the top. Uh, and be moving around. And this is a shredded material. It's kind of like, this is a gross analogy, but it's kind of like pulled pork where it's been stranded and pulled apart. And so when you place it, it holds to itself and makes this mat and it's got big particles and it's got little particles and things don't tend to float and things don't tend to move quite as much with this animal friendly hog fuel. Uh, it does a really good job of spreading loads out when you're walking over the top of it. And it does just an amazing job of keeping weeds down. Any weeds that do come through, tend the roots tend to be bound up in the mulch and not the soil. So when you walk over, they're very easy to pull out. Um, this uh, Using this, we started using this about eight years ago, and it made a huge difference in the function of our facilities. Uh, the ponding depth, like I said, needs to be at least six inches deep. Uh, and um, if you go deeper than that, it means deeper side slopes, and sometimes that ends up getting really steep. Uh, if you have a small facility and things start to look a little bit weird. So um, there is a little bit of uh, thought that needs to go into the ponding depth. The ponding depth should not have standing water in it for longer than 72 hours. If it does, the facility is considered failed and there's probably gonna be some mitigating action that you'll have to take in order to go back in and fix that. Um, one thing that we do do occasionally is put in a berm around the down, downstream edge, and that's to try and get a consistent elevation all the way around the perimeter of the facility so that everything fills and overflows all at the same time, um, uh, all at the same rate, and then you can control where the water overflows. So then for your overflow, you'd usually go just cut a little uh, short weir in the bottom edge of that berm, uh, and then as water gets high enough, it overflows via the weir. Um, we usually use excavated soil from the vegetated treatment area when we do the initial excavation. Uh, usually we're hauling, again, huge amounts of soil off the site, so any of that soil that we can use on that surrounding berm is good. Uh, we cover it in mulch and we plant it with uh, a type of plants that prefer uh, drier conditions. Uh, it's usually about six to 12 inches tall and four to six uh, feet wide. We like to make it much wider than it is tall so it doesn't look like this big wall around the outside. It is kind of graded in a way that's more natural. Uh, hey Derek, 
Yes. Derek, this is Nicole. Do you mind if I interrupt you? Sorry, some of the questions are coming in just a hair of a lag time for me, but I've okay. got two related, just one, uh, just what you were talking to previous to the berm. The first question was, how often does the hog fuel need to be replaced? Mm -hmm. I think when you were discussing that about your pulled pork just a minute ago. Yes, so uh, replacing the hog fuel, usually this is not an issue, uh, for most of our residential suburban urban stuff. Uh, the one thing is it does kind of bleach a little bit of a blonde color and it will degrade over time. So we usually come in and put in three inches, three, four inches of mulch down at first. And then I usually recommend that people come in and just top dress it with like an inch of mulch every year. It freshens everything up and then it, it helps with that degradation. Um, the VTAs are a little bit different in that we're dealing, the mulch layer and the VTA is even more important than in the other facilities that we do in the more urban settings because it does a really, really good job of screening the solids coming off of the dairy waste. Uh, both of the facilities that we put in produce a lot of solids and you can go out there and you can see them sitting on top of the mulch layer. And that mulch layer acts as a really good screen and it makes it really easy to replace the mulch. So you just go in with a pitchfork, you scoop it all up and the, and the mulch comes up with the solids. You can get rid of that and then you just come back and replace that mulch. Uh, I would recommend that uh, they look at that at least once a year, probably usually in the spring, uh, uh, spring months uh, of getting in there and, and replacing and they're just usually replacing a little patch of it. They're not replacing the whole thing, but uh, there'll be a little patch where most of the solids have filtered out and then you just scoop that up and then, and then bring in a yard or so of mulch. Okay, thank you. Two more questions for you there. Um, will this system work for runoff from a livestock heavy use area or paddock? Yes, it will. Yep, the, the, the Kameno facility has a large, you'll see, I'll show you a video in a minute um, of some of the runoff coming off of it. So yeah, it can handle pretty much any load that you put on it in terms of waste. Uh, and uh, the heavier load, obviously the bigger the facility, that was part of the issue with the Kamano facility was we had such a heavy load that we really had to make it really large in order to compensate for that. But yeah, this will work off of a heavy use area. I've done two smaller versions of this for livestock and both of them. Uh, one was off of, was overflow, drainage overflow from um, uh, uh, waste storage facility, manure uh, storage facility, composting facility, and the other was for a heavy use area. Awesome. Okay, one more question for you. Okay, uh, the other question was, rather than dig down, is it possible to use soil from the farm or site and construct a built up pond and then add the bioretention soil a mulch on top of that as long as it's a slope down from the inlet? Yeah, so I mean, that's totally possible. Uh, you still probably wanna scalp everything underneath just to make sure that you have a good contact with well draining native soil. Uh, we've done different versions of that and it's worked really well. Um, uh, yeah, and the biggest issue is just elevation. Most of the time we're trying to get this work uh, from gravity. We do have some pump systems that we use and they, those work fine. They're usually from sump pumps from basements and that type of thing. But just trying to figure out how to get the water into the facility uh, would be the challenge. But if you have a decent slope and it's at the bottom uh, and, and you have you know an upstream country, contributing area that's significantly higher than the downstream where you're going to have your facility and that would that would work for sure. Okay, that's all the questions for now. You can get back okay. to where you were, Derek. Thanks. Cool. So this berm around the perimeter, like I said, we want to have it wider and shorter and not look like this wall uh, uh, around the, the outside edge. This picture, it's a little, I wish, the downside of taking pictures of bioretention facilities after they're mulched is uh, it kind of camouflages itself, so it's hard to tell what's going on. But they built this long berm around the outside edge. But this berm here on this side here is a little bit too steep. Uh, so it kind of starts to look like a crater. Uh, and they really should have kicked this berm out a lot wider and had the peak be a little further back. And uh, as it is, 
the way they did it is it comes up at a peak and then and then tapers off and it just doesn't look as nice so uh, that's kind of what i'm talking about with the firms so question Quick yeah, question ahead. for you, Derek. Um, so a uh, question about, would you recommend fencing around that treatment area? It can see in a few years, people not realizing that it is not an extra space to park a tractor or equipment or drive through it. So do you recommend fencing those off? Yeah, uh, less of an issue for the Qualco one because it's a giant hole. Uh, but yeah, uh, it is something that we'll have, we'll have to consider uh, on the Camino one. Uh, and it has come up. We didn't have funding for it at the time. We were really down to the last penny um, on the Camino project that we did. But yeah, it's probably a good idea. If there's concern about livestock getting into it, fencing that off would be important too. Uh, yeah, and it's not going to be able to take a vehicle load. So you would. the good news is you wouldn't get very far if you tried to park in it. You'd probably just sink immediately because um, the soils are pretty soft. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, it might be a good idea to put some kind of exclusionary fence around. Uh, okay, thanks. So, yes, if you don't have an ideal site, you don't have well draining soils, you have some elevation issues, overflow problems, there are some things that we can do to make that help. So this is a traditional under drain system, and this is what most people use if they're not using the vertical underdrain system that we developed. And it, this uh, system here is the reason we did use, we developed the vertical underdrain system because it has some real problems. And the idea here is that you're basically putting a large uh, collection facility, basically a really large trench drain facility underneath the bioretention soil. So this is all drain rock underneath here. And then you have this large grid of, of perforated pipe and so the water would flow through the bioretention soil and then get into this pipe system and then that would act as an overflow. And this is for scenarios where you really have poorly infiltrating soil, um, uh, but you're still trying to get some type of infiltration and then some type of treatment capacity from that bioretention soil. This has lots of problems. Uh, one is it's incredibly expensive to build uh, it costs almost as, it basically doubles the cost of the project because you have to over excavate, you have to bring in a whole bunch of specialized material. Uh, it's really labor intensive. Uh, and it also has the issue that it tends to short circuit the treatment. So what happens is water is polluted water comes in and the retention time through the soil, uh, basically the, the water just goes straight down and then immediately engages this pipe and leaves the system. And so the water is only engaging that bioretention soil for minutes, and it should be engaging it for days, ideally, if it, if it really needs the full uh, treatment. So uh, that is kind of the older way of how they used to do these under drains. Uh, this, again, is, is the vertical under drain. And the idea here is water is coming off of a polluted surface. It dives down into this uh, bioretention soil, and then it moves laterally. Uh, uh, all the way across the facility, allowing it to infiltrate, and then it gives it, and giving it a much higher retention time. And then it goes down underneath this sock of drain rock up into the middle of that uh, vertically oriented pipe and then leaves the system. This also has a ball valve on it located here so we can turn the whole system off if we need to. Let's like say in the summer where we're really not worried about an overflow event and we want as much residence time within the soil as possible, we can just come in here, turn that ball valve off, turn the overflow off, and then turn it back on again in the winter. This is what the vertical underdrain looks like. This is in my office. So it's just this vertical piece of 18 inch pipe. There's a horizontal pipe, there's a grid on top, and this is what the unit at the Qualco dairy looks like. Um, the soils at the Qualco Dairy infiltrate really, really well. When we finally dug down and looked at what we had, we were very pleased uh, with uh, the underlying soils. So uh, despite putting in this vertical underdrain, we have never seen standing water inside of this pipe because water that enters uh, through the inlet here basically just dives straight down and, and infiltrates almost immediately. Uh, and because of that, they've actually been adding more and more surfaces to this facility over time. They've been uh, connecting uh, barn downspouts uh, and, and piping more and more 
water to this inlet here just because it does such a good job of mitigating uh, mitigating runoff from the site. So uh, I'd like to see eventually maybe even half of the dairy would be able to come here and, and uh, be treated within this facility. Um, one thing that I have mentioned kind of a couple of times is the idea of terracing. This is for facilities that we have on a grade and you can see here we're a lot higher in elevation than we are down here. So what we end up doing is making multiple cells separated by a wall. And so the water would, would enter here, it would infiltrate into this upper cell, it would overflow and then go down into this next cell here. And that's so that we don't have this really tall wall on the back end. When we did this facility in Everett about nine years ago, we used what's called compost socks. So this is a geotextile fabric sock that we fill with compost and we use that to separate the upper cell from the lower cell. In the uh, Kameno uh, dairy, we just ended up using uh, weirs made out of pure, pure um, uh, mulch. So we, we graded the whole thing with a bioretention soil, and then every 100 feet, we made a mound of pure mulch um, so that it would hit that mulch, still flow through it mostly, uh, uh, but then any overflow would come over the top of that. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like when it's done. Yeah, question? Yeah. Yeah, sorry to, not to interrupt. I thought you were done with that no. segment, Derek. So someone was asking specific to this, uh, what type of maintenance are you having to do with these and what is the maintenance schedule? So it re maintenance really comes down to uh, plant control. Uh, it depends on how what you plant and how crazy things get. Uh, so far, they they the few maintenance little maintenance we've done so far has been replacing some of the plants that didn't survive, and then that occasional uh, uh, pitchforking out the mulch, and then uh, replacing it with a new mulch. Once the system's established, it's incredibly hardy. Uh, it becomes a living system, and it kind of operates like a miniature forest, and it kind of takes care of itself. It provides its own mulch source. Uh, over time. Uh, the root systems on the plants that we're putting in grow down and tend to open these soils up more and more and more um, so that both the treatment capacity for the system increases over time and the infiltration capacity increases over time to the point where on the very few occasions where we've put in a facility that didn't infiltrate well for the first year, we tell people to wait and I'd say 80% of the time, the next year, it's fixed itself just because those plants have taken over and the system is equalized and it's starting to infiltrate the water better than it used to. Um, uh, other than that, if we get a really dry summer, we might need to water the plants. Um, but ideally, we're putting in native plants that after a year or two will be well established and won't need to be watered. Hey, Derek, one more question for you. Um, do you have, actually two more, um, do you have guidance on selecting plants for Maybe. vegetative treatment areas? So that's a whole thing. Uh, and we, and I didn't have time to really dive into the plant part on this. And I'm not really as much a plant expert. We have other people in the office that really do the plant thing. But yeah, there's a whole separate phase of this that involves plant selection uh, and location and maintenance and that type of thing. Uh, the, I send, end up sending most people back to the rain garden handbook for Western Washington because there's a huge plant list in the back. Um, on the Kameno facility, we ended up putting in a number of poplars because there was uh, some interesting research that had gone on about poplars uh, being exceptionally good at removing fecals and mitigating for some other nutrient loads. So we're trying that uh, in an attempt to um, to add an extra layer. But for the most part, we're just putting in um, uh, multiple layers of native uh, vegetation. And you do have to consider, because it is that bowl shape, you want to put the stuff that likes wettest soils in the middle of the bowl and then uh, and then phase it out. So that and then by the end time you're up on your upper edge of the berm, you're into plants that prefer drier conditions. Great. One one last question at this yeah. time. Um, for the VTAs, is there any issues with sediment filling them in and needing to be scraped out? 
Yeah, so that's that same issue as we have with the dairy solids. Um, and actually on the Kamano one, we were so concerned about the solids. And if you go out there now, you can see it's, there's just a ton of solids in internet system. We were so concerned that we actually made the first 25 feet of the facility pure compost. We didn't put any bioretention soil at all in. It was it's it's close to four and a half feet of compost or not sorry not compost mulch, uh, four and a half feet of mulch. So that uh, when that mulch does eventually plug up with solids and sediments, they can just bring in an excavator, dig the whole thing out, and then just backfill it with mulch without having to worry about the soil at all. Uh, and then the so then the rest of the 525 uh, feet of that facility has that underlying bioretention soil. Uh, but it, yeah, if you have something like our Kamano facility where there's just a ton of sediment and solids, um, it probably needs to be cleaned out. That facility will probably need to be cleaned out once every two years or so. Um, but that's it's really an except that one is really an exceptional facility because the, the solid loads are so heavy. But you're really only cleaning that that uh, upper basin, um, and the solids only tend to infiltrate through about three, four, five inches of that mulch. Um, and, and in most situations, when you, uh, a facility does fill with sediment, you're really only replacing the top six inches. So about three inches of mulch and three inches of bioretention soil are really all that needs to happen to bring that facility back up. Um, and then the underlying stuff is usually pretty, pretty safe uh, just because the mulch and the bioretention soil do a really good job of screening. Great, thank you, Derek. Yeah, so this again is that Kamano facility. You can see the terraces. Um, and again, this had a grade of about 5% from the very top down to the bottom. So we had to put these terraces in every 100 feet um, to make sure. And the other thing we were concerned about is water just flowing too quickly down the bioretention facility. So we put those terraces in to try and slow everything down a little bit. Uh, yeah, so planting. This is uh, when this is the Qualco facility when we had staged all of the plants, uh, and this is what it looks like after, immediately after planting. We just used bare root stuff that we got that we had from our plant sale, pretty simple, small stuff, uh, and then um, and then it grew in over time. I think that's one year later uh, after everything had been planted. So the planting is really important. Um, uh, but it's the easiest part of the whole process. Uh, I think it took our crew about a day and a half to do to do all that. Uh, they didn't end up having to water too much because they did it in later in the season in October. Uh, and I think they came back next spring. No, they came back next summer and replaced maybe 10% of the plants that uh, didn't make it. But other than that, everything else worked well. All right, look at that, 50 minutes on the nose. Any questions? Well done, Derek. Yeah, we've got chat box. I will remember folks or remind folks, please put in your questions in the chat box or raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask it direct. So we do have one in the chat box um, that says, what are the permit considerations associated with these facilities? Understanding it may vary somewhat by county, of course. Yes, thank you. That was a, that's a very good question. These were all very easy to get exemptions for under our Snohomish County code. So we did not require any permits for any of this because they met the requirements of our ag exemptions, which was very nice. Uh, that made things very, very easy. That will depend on what county you're in. Uh, but because we weren't adding any impervious area at all, uh, and all of this could be justified under, um, and we weren't in floodplain, that was another thing. Uh, all of this could be justified under the ag exemption. Eric, you made reference to a video earlier. Did, was there a video oh, yeah, you yeah. wanted to show? Thank you. Yes, I'm gonna show this. Everybody see that okay? This is a, so this was, there was a very light rain going on and this is the outflow from that Camino uh, facility. And you can see the density of the nutrients in that overflow is pretty high. So I just wanted to show you guys that. And, and like I said, it's the facility is really handling it very well. Okay, 
couple more questions here. Um, we had a couple people ask about, can they contact you uh, to talk more about this and or are you able to help other districts with these designs? Yes, I, I can definitely be contacted. And yeah, I'd love to partner with other districts uh, on a design on this, especially as, I mean, we have the existing cluster and, and we're also working under uh, some existing stormwater action team funding, which I think is only the, the 12 districts uh, on the west side. But but yeah, no, I'd love to partner with other people on this, especially if we can find a funding source um, for me to do some design work. And as long as I can fit it into my existing workload. Great. Um, another question, a, a fun question. Um, oh. You have taken into account wildlife that could use these facilities, which plants um, chose and the layout. Also, have you ever had any issues with animals getting into the overflow pipe? Um, that has not been much of an issue. We put a grate on it that's pretty fine. Um, and uh, And if they're, and we put a number of these in places like schools and stuff. So these grates have the ability to be locked down. Um, so uh, we would just put a bolt in it so that they they can't get into the overflow pipe. Um, uh, there hasn't been much of an issue with uh, any anim wildlife or animals getting up into the inlet screens or anything like that. Uh, it's the same system as you'd use in any stormwater facility. Uh, so any of uh, those issues would would be there. Um, but it hasn't been much of an issue at all, mostly because during a heavy rain, these pipes flow uh, pretty in intensely and anything that would be up in there uh, would probably get blown out. And most animals are pretty good at recognizing that that might not be a good spot to hang out. So no, that hasn't been much of an issue. Um, and then wildlife considerations, we have done a number of facilities that have specifically been designed to be part of wildlife corridors um, and planted for different varieties of birds or insects. Great. What about uh, larger livestock walking into these? Maybe that relates back to the fencing question as well. Yeah. I mean, they'd sink is what would happen. I mean, they wouldn't sink very far, right? Um, uh, but yeah, if, I, if a cow got into that, it, it probably, again, it probably wouldn't get very far. It would only probably go down about a foot and a half before it met some resistance. Um, but uh, yeah, it probably wouldn't do it. Hopefully it wouldn't do it again, because uh, like I said, it wouldn't get very far. And and yeah, if you really do have, if that really is a concern, some type of fence would probably be good idea. Okay, folks, if you have any other questions, please put them in the questions box and or you can raise your hand. I'll unmute you and you can ask it. But um, please, if there are any other questions, please feel free to put them in. Um, Derek, it looks like at this time, maybe folks are typing, but we don't have any additional questions. Is there anything else you wanted to offer? Um, anything else you wanted to add to the presentation that you had thoughts about? Oh, someone did ask, by the way, um, did we discuss budget and costs for these? Yeah. So if you want to add a little bit of that, that'd be great. Yeah, so both of those larger facilities, like I said, were done for about $50,000. Um, uh, and so in terms of we, when we're doing smaller facilities, it's, I have a, a, uh, a much easier time, um, doing the, the estimates for those because we've done so many of them. Um, usually a smaller facility in the order of 250 to 400 square feet costs about between 3,500 and $6,000, uh, to put in. Um, and that, and that could handle something like a, like a heavy use area, a small heavy use area or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, for these really large dairy facilities, um, I'm pretty confident we could do, we could probably do a full dairy with, I'd say, you know, five to six acres of, uh, impervious area, uh, for probably a hundred to $120,000. Um. Both of these just took portions of the dairy uh, when we put them in. Okay, we do have a couple more questions. Um, next one, can you discuss reductions in nutrients or bacteria loads? Yes. 
So there's a huge amount of work that's been done on this by the stormwater or um, stormwater center. The WSU Extension Office has a stormwater research center down in Puyallup. So there's a whole bunch of stuff on nutrient loading and fecals and uh, that type of mitigation specific things that you need to consider. Uh, the, the base summary is as long, if you can get it to infiltrate natively into the soil, uh, it's fantastic. It really does a good job at, soil just does a fantastic job at nutrient removal and, um, and uh, uh, fecal mitigation. Uh, the, it, it does a really good job at everything. Um, if you do end up putting in some type of uh, underdrain system and you think you're going to get frequent and large overflow events through that underdrain system, there are some specific things that you need to take into account um, when it comes to nutrients because it may not do as good a job at uh, mitigating for, um, for some of those nutrients. But there, there are lots of things that we can do to tweak the design to help account for that. So that's what my answer is on that. Um, uh, Herrera has also done a huge amount of studies on this bioretention soil and its capacity to remove pollutants, or I mean nutrients and uh, and other pollutants. Uh, so I I recommend just Googling those two and and looking into their research. Okay, uh, another question: Is there info on your website or elsewhere about the dairy projects that you've done? I think we have done a number of, a couple story, I think we did a story each in our newsletter, but that was a while ago. Uh, I'd have to talk to Kari who manages our uh, website to find those. Okay, um, and question, um, do you, have you ever incorporated biochar into any of these swales as also a remediation and or to introduce different material in there instead of hog fuel? We have not played much with biochar. Uh, it's been on my radar for a long time. We just haven't had the opportunity. Uh, we've been talking with Ani again down at the Stormwater Center a couple times about that. Uh, it would just, I mean, we'd be really interested. We'd be, we'd love to try it. It just, our opportunity hasn't come up yet. So. Oh, well, I'll talk to you later about that then, Derek. Okay. I may have a connection for you. Okay. Um, it looks like uh, there. I'm seeing no other questions come into the chat box, and we're also at um, the 12 o'clock hour. Folks, fe please feel free to enter in any final questions, um, and maybe Derek can hang around if Great. any additional ones come in. Otherwise, um, thank you so much, Derek. Um, you have been a great speaker today. Thank you for taking the time. Um, greatly appreciate your expertise. I know that everyone online is giving you a clap um, on their own. Thank you all for acknowledging our speaker, Derek. Um, so thank you so much, Derek. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Um, and for those, uh, just so you know, not only are all these recorded, but we'll, we will also be posting up the speaker's contact information, but you can see it um, on his last slide here if you want to connect with Derek further. Uh, sounds like he's open to that and on partnering on different projects. So please do follow up with him.